Hey there, I'm your host, Ricky Shockley. Welcome to the MedSpa Success Strategies Podcast, where MedSpa and aesthetics practice owners come to discover strategies and tactics that help them better market and manage their practices so they can grow, scale, and have more financial freedom. I'm really excited to be joined today by Sarah Schickman. Sarah is a healthcare lawyer, entrepreneur, and the author of MedSpa Confidential, a number one new bestseller on Amazon on how to grow an aesthetics business. Sarah is the managing partner of Lingia Law. She specializes in healthcare, tech, and beauty industries. Helping people is her passion. Sarah launched and led several multi-million dollar businesses and has helped hundreds of others. As president of an e-commerce company, Sarah achieved 13 plus million dollars in revenue within 24 months of launch. As general counsel and director of sales of a multi-state medical aesthetics practices, she helped grow the practice from a single room location to 12 locations and over $13 million in annual revenue. So thanks, Sarah. Appreciate having you on the podcast. Really looking forward to this conversation. You know, I had a chance to read through the book and I thought it was awesome. Even as someone that works with med spas and has been in marketing for 10 plus years, I was taking notes and screenshots because there were so many little good quotes and parts in the book that I thought were super relevant to marketing and managing managing a spa, which is what this podcast is all about. So could you start, I guess, with just a little bit of your backstory, how you got into the med spa industry, you're opening your first spa? Sure. Yeah. And it's a pleasure to be here, Ricky. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, how I got into the med spa space. So um, I kind of got into it almost by accident. I was um, in my early 30s, which was a long time ago. Um, and I had never done or heard about Botox. And my husband at the time was like, I want to start an aesthetics business and I need someone to help me run it. Um, you're an entrepreneur, you've done these things before, can you help me start an aesthetics clinic? And I said, well, where? And he said, well, um, in the building where we're living, we have like, you know, a room that I've renovated that could be a med spa. And I was like, okay, sure, yeah, let's do it. And so I got to it almost by accident, um, not knowing anything about the industry, just knowing that everyone wants to look more beautiful, including me. So that's interesting. What was your background? Because I know you had an entrepreneurial background prior to that. Do you want to talk about that just for a little bit? Because I think that's interesting, like the transition you made career-wise into starting the spa. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. So I was a corporate lawyer and then uh, friends of mine were starting an online furniture startup, um, like, I don't know, I guess it's probably 15 years ago now. And they called me and they said, we need a CEO. Do you want to come run a furniture startup? And I said, um, sure, let me try it. And I did that for about three years and I grew the company from literally zero to a little over $14 million in annual revenue. So I w- I've always loved growing companies and starting companies and helping people start companies. Um, but I, all I had really known was practicing law and also running this online furniture startup. Yeah, I know, and I know that tied into like, you, you ended up building like a marketing background almost a little bit by accident, I guess, along the way, right? Yeah, uh, totally by accident. I mean, I really didn't know anything about marketing. I just knew that you could have the greatest product um, and the greatest service, but if nobody knows about it, um, your business is not going to be successful. And so based on that, I just always understood the importance of marketing and how you have to figure it out and also how you have to have expertise in it. Otherwise, like I said, if even you could be the greatest injector or, or whatever lawyer, but if nobody knows about it, um, you're not going to be successful. So I've got like some specific questions. Like I mentioned, I loved the book and there were so many awesome takeaways. And uh, just like as an overview, I know you talked about struggling, like not necessarily struggling, but starting off really small. And you have a whole chapter in the book about starting off small, which you did yourself. How did you go from over the overview of how you went from this small one room spa into building out 14 locations over the course of several years? So I think starting small is definitely the key. I think even if you have millions of dollars or lots of investors, it's much better to start small because you can control small and perfect processes. So we started very small, but right away we started writing things down. Like, how do you reconstitute Botox? What time do people need to come to work? Uh, what is our procedure for you know, different, um, different in-office things? So we started small, but right away started hiring people so that it wasn't just us sitting in the office doing all the work. We always were growing a team. And so I think starting small, you may not spend a lot of money on rent. You may not spend a lot of money on equipment, but you have some money left over to spend on people. And so what we did is we started small, but right away we had an injector who wasn't me and who wasn't uh, my husband. We had a 
uh, office manager, we had a receptionist. And so as the team grows, then you can go and look at locations, expand into additional rooms. And so um, it was really uh, like a step-by-step process, but also it was about seeing opportunity and really capitalizing on it and not, um, not being afraid because you're small and nimble. And so you can move very, very quickly. Yeah. And then you're, I guess you're kind of letting your patient growth dictate your growth as a practice, right? Like it's, as you start to outgrow your space, you move into the next space and just kind of adjust accordingly. Yeah. And if you're small enough, you can do that pretty quickly. So, yeah. you know, and you don't have to wait. Like sometimes I talk to people and they're like, well, I'm booked out two months or I'm booked out six weeks. I think that's too long. I think that that means your patients are going somewhere else potentially because the, today's modern consumer cannot wait. Just like when people contact me for a law consultations today, if I can't get them in within a few days, a lot of times they they already go and talk to someone else. So I think like you have to f- be there for the consumer when they need you. So if you have one room and you see there are too many people, okay, you have to get a second room. You can't be at a place where you can't get people in. That's a that's a, that's a bad problem to have. That's really interesting too, because you have so many of the successful practices and spas right now that are kind of in that situation. Where, where it, it like the most successful spas right now, they're the ones that are booked six, out six to eight weeks. But it's kind of interesting. I had a, a call with a, a spa a few weeks back and she was talking about how she used to kind of dominate her area 15, 20 years ago. She was one of the first people in her area doing a lot of the things that she was doing. And she kind of got complacent. And I guess that's the danger of being in that in that position where you're booking out six to eight weeks. Slowly, there's the potential that those clients start booking appointments at other places because they can get in on a shorter notice. Yeah, definitely. And that's the danger of becoming complacent too in anything, like in any in in our business relationships and our personal relationships with our marketing, you have to continue innovating like every single day because somebody else is going to come along and innovate better if you're, you know, just kind of saying, oh, I'm, I'm growing 10% a year. That's nice. You know, that's to me, like 10% growth is slow death. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I don't wish that upon anybody. Um, I think in this industry, you could be growing 30, 40, 50% a year, even if you have a big business. So yeah, I think uh, really adapting to the customer and having a really open schedule is actually key. If you're a practice that's kind of in that situation where you are really busy, things are going great, but you're but you're so busy that you're booked out six to eight weeks, is the next step generally to get a second location maybe nearby, or is it to find a different office? Like, What's your recommendation, I guess, in that regard when it comes to growth? I think that's a really good question. And um, I think actually the better step is to build out your big location rather than open a second location. A lot of people think it's great to have like one room here and one room there and, and you're traveling all over the place and you have inventory everywhere. It's much harder to manage staff and overhead and marketing if you have multiple locations. So much better, I think, to have a single location. And I mean, I know clients who are literally in the middle of nowhere, their town has 50,000 people and somehow their location does $2 million a year. So you could have a huge location, even a small town. Um, I wouldn't do like single room locations in multiple places. I think it's much better to just focus on one location at first and then make it big, like four or five rooms and then move on to the next location. Yeah. And then when you do get that to that point where like, let's say you're going to open a second legitimate location and maybe not just another room, what goes into that decision? Because I know not that's not in the cards for all spa owners. Not everybody wants to do that, and, but it's a decision some people make. And once you make that decision, first of all, I guess what goes into making that decision? And then how do you make sure that the recipe for success that you experience at your first location carries over to the new locations as you grow and expand and start building out other offices? Good question. So I think If you are the primary injector at your practice, if you're like making most of the revenue, um, you have to be thinking twice, three times, 10 times before opening a second location. So the first thing you need to do is have other people besides you who can actually like do the work. Um, And then the other thing is having everything written down so you can have real consistency between locations, like how they look, all the processes your staff has to follow, for everything from how people should dress to what they should say when customers walk in through the door or answer the phone to how you guys do Botox and fillers. I understand like there's a lot of individuality and artistry and all that, but the key to multiple successful locations, I think, is standard procedures. 
um, and the business not really being dependent on you as the key producer, because then all you're doing is taking your revenue from that one location and splitting it among, you know, two or three places and adding a long commute to your day. Yeah. I know there's a part of the book where it even talks about, you know, with patient experience, giving people a cup of coffee and giving them them a little office tour as opposed to just shuttling them straight to the procedure room. So even that could be part of, I'm assuming, of like the standard procedures is like really go down into the details of what you do to make the patient experience as excellent as it possibly can be. Yeah. And imagine like in your main location, you do the office tour and you give people coffee and you have a M-Scope machine. And then in your second location, it's much smaller. You don't have, you don't do the office tour. You don't have the m So it's a completely different patient experience and your patient gets confused and they're like, okay, one seems high end and nice and has much more services. This other one doesn't, I can't remember which one is which it's, it's not good. So it has to be as much as possible, like the same thing at every location. If you're going to give people coffee, please give it to them every single time. Otherwise it's like the the customer gets confused very easily. Yeah, that makes sense. I know there are some spas that open like a satellite office that happens that might be much smaller. They're probably paying it less attention. And I'm sure those are not getting the same, giving the same type of patient experience that the primary location's providing. So that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Um, so in, in the book, you mentioned, I think at one point in the book, it says two keys to success of the spa are staff and operations. On our previous episode, we talked a lot about staffing and hiring and the importance of your team. And you go into a, a lot of that in the book. Can you just speak to like the importance of staff and, and retention strategies for spa owners? I feel like that topic like deserves like a pause. Yeah. Like, I had like seven, bu- like sub bullet points on it. <laughs> it is so important in this, in this business, what you, what we're selling is not the Botox and not the fillers. It's the customer experience and the people who are selling that customer experience are the staff. So the staff is like the most important thing. The clients follow the staff. The staff is responsible for how the clients feel. So yeah, I think the most important thing is making the staff feel good and appreciated and training them and keeping them. And it's very hard because everyone these days wants to be their own boss and wants to open up their own place. And there's a place for that too. But as a lawyer, I see like the ugly sides of that too, where people try to have the strictest non-compete agreements in order to keep their staff. But really, like you can't fix a bad culture with a non-compete agreement. You could make somebody sign an agreement that says they owe you $100,000 if they want to leave. And if you have a bad work environment for them, they're still going to want to leave. They're going to break the agreement and find any way to leave, even if if they signed a very strong non-compete. Staff is the number one thing that makes or breaks uh, this business for sure. Yeah. And I know in the book, it also talks about paying staff. And obviously there are all sorts of things you can do with retention strategies from culture and treating employees well and respecting them and, and all of those things. But there are a big component of it, especially nowadays is going to be pay structure. So do you have any like recommendations for, for making sure that you're paying people appropriately and that you're competitive in terms of your wages from your front office staff to your injectors? Yeah. I think one thing you can do is um, a lot of the uh, pharmaceutical companies like Allergan, for example, will give you information on what's, what are market rate salaries. So one thing you can do is become educated on what are market rate salaries. And you can also look at Indeed and see what people are advertising job postings at. So you have to pay people well. The other thing is you want to encourage retention. And so um, Mary Beth Hagen from Titan Aesthetic had a great idea. She said, you could offer people retention bonuses. So basically at at their one year anniversary of employment, let's say they get a bonus at two years, they get a bigger bonus, three years, they get a bigger bonus. So you can incentivize people to stay out of, uh, you know, it being a great place to stay and financially, as opposed to punishing them if they want to leave the punishment part over time, I think doesn't really work. And, And I know there was even a part tying that same kind of principle, I guess, about giving people an incentive to to stay, that's also talked about with the uh, the loyalty programs, which I think we'll get to in a second here. But I wanted to stick on stick on the staff concept first. And there's one thing that, just as a marketing person, we always talk about this. It's you're really not selling the tools; you're selling your ability to use those tools effectively. I think Gary Vaynerchuk had this example about basketball. It's like, what's the ROI of a basketball? For me, it's nothing. For Michael Jordan, it's billions of dollars. And the, the same could be said for pretty much any skill set. So how do you make sure that you have people that, because I know it's hard to train and to find people that are, that have that artistic element and and really can 
get the outcomes that you're looking for. So how do you train people to use those tools appropriately? And how do you make sure that you've got some sort of quality control with that component of the business? Yeah, good question. I think it, the vendors have some training that is pretty good. And so I think step one is to get people trained with the basics from your vendors. So your Allergan, Galderma, and other vendors will have Botox and filler training on the label for how to do basic things. That's step one. Step two is you really have to develop an internal training and continuous improvement program. So having a written down program of what, of what your training looks like, and then having a timeline and having expectations set for your staff. Like at six months, you should be able to do X. At one year, you should be able to do Y. And have it really written down so that everybody knows and have very frequent progress checks. Like, okay, you've been here 90 days. Are you happy? Do you know how to do cheek fillers? You know, have you been trained on, on the cool sculpting machine? All that stuff. So I think just really formalizing the training because really there are no real training programs for this at universities or um, for big formal schools. I think they're yeah. starting and they're going to happen. But right now the training has to happen in the practice. I guess from there too, like once you have people that you feel like that you've got a, a staff that can use these tools maybe better than other providers in town and you're trying to be competitive in, in regard to your skill set, how do you actually communicate that to patients effectively? Is it just before and afters? Like how do you how do you explain to them that, you know, just going to get Botox, you're not going to get the same result everywhere you go and a skilled injector and a good staff is going to really make a, a big difference in terms of the outcome. Yeah. I mean, I think credentialing uh, happens not just through before and afters, but uh, a lot of different ways. It starts from the first phone call, right? When someone calls the practice or your website where you have customer, not just reviews, but even perhaps video testimonials. And then when people call you and they say, what's the price of a unit of Botox? You change the conversation and you train your staff to stay well, actually, you know, our master injector, Sarah, has been here for 15 years and, and, you know, she does this and this. So I think it's about really having the training for your staff or, or outsourcing it to a agency that will actually like credential your staff for you, set the appointments for you so that you can really focus on, let's say if you're not good at that particular side or you don't have the staff, you could hire someone to do it for you. Um, and then making sure that you don't just use before and afters, you use videos and you, your staff knows the credentials of everyone and is able to speak to it um, in, a, in a way that customers can understand and relate to. Makes total sense. Yeah. So one of the things I want to talk about was just um, the concept of business models and knowing your unique value proposition. And I know it's challenging for small businesses in general, med spas being mostly small businesses, to figure out a way to really meaningfully differentiate their services. And I think you talk about kind of picking a lane. Like, are you going to be the upscale spa in town that's got like the, the nicest offices, like everything is really high end and luxury? Or are you going to be the price competitive spa? Do you generally recommend that you really try to stick to one of those lanes as a spa owner? Or is there some sort of hybrid where you can be the spa that is you have really nice offices and fair pricing. Is it a matrix or is it really try to pick one of those lanes and, and focus on that as much as possible? I think um, I really believe in the KISS principle, which is keep it simple, stupid. And I think you have to stay in your lane. So everything, every store that we could think of has its own um, unique positioning. So Walmart, you know, has an okay customer experience, but you know, you're going to get very good prices. Saks Fifth Avenue has a good customer experience, and you know that the prices are a little bit high. So Saks Fifth Avenue doesn't try to have the best prices. Um, Walmart doesn't try to have the best customer experience. I think if you try to have the best prices and the most luxurious customer experience, two hour appointment times and give people a lunch and, and coffee, your net profit will be minus 5%. You know, so yeah. um, I think you can't be everything. You just have to pick. And then your consumers will also be clear about what they want and whether it's a match. Like some consumers, a lot of the modern consumers want like the 10 minute Botox. They don't want to spend two hours in your office. They don't really care as much about, you know, the injector being, let's say the greatest injector. Sometimes they just want to get in and out and have a good consistent result. So that's a very different practice than a practice that where the injector really knows you, they're asking you about your boyfriend and they give you coffee and, you know, they help you call your Uber or whatever. So I think 
if you try to be everything to everyone, you're going to be nothing to them and you're going to go out of business. That yeah. That's a strong opinion. I mean, people okay, can know that. That makes sense. Do you have any tips on kind of how to communicate that? Or there's there's a quote that I always like from the book called The Advertising Effect, and it's that action changes attitude faster than attitude changes action. I use it all the time. Do you think that's the case with communicating like w what your lane kind of is as a practice? Do you have to have people in the office for them to kind of to understand that? Or do you think there's an effective way to communicate that with marketing and advertising with social media ahead of time? I think both. I think that there's a way to communicate it with marketing and social media ahead of time, but it has to be consistent with what's in the office. So I think the whole branding is like the in-office experience and the out-of-office experience together. So they all have to be consistent and you have to think about it ahead of time, not just when they come in. Your marketing has to speak whatever your brand brand language is. And like again, I say you should write it down. So that nobody's confused. So that when you're opening your second location, you have in your employee handbook or other materials, it says like our company values are, let's say, great prices, on-time appointments, and um, consistent results, right? That's, that's one type of practice. And if you communicate that to everyone, including your marketing company, or if you do your marketing internally, then that's very different than our values are the best results in Manhattan, um, you know, luxurious setting and we will pamper you different. Yeah, that makes sense. It's almost like you kind of need that written down and it needs to be referenced because it's kind of your North star for everything that you do. If you're going to be the kind of spa that wants to get people in and out in 10 minutes, then you can't have your injectors having 30 minute personal conversations with their patients. Right. And you can't hire people who want to do that because their values yeah. will not be aligned with yours and they're going to want to leave. So, you know, it's, it, it all has to be go against those or go toward those values. Like even in, at my firm now, if someone asks me to do something, I always think about, does it align with who we are as a firm and what we stand for? And if it does, great, then, they, then I should tell them yes. And if it doesn't, even if it makes sense it, or it could make sense in other business contexts, I have to say no, because that's not who we are. So you just have to decide also like who you are as a person. You know, like, do you like... Chanel or do you like Louis Vuitton or do you like Walmart? And you know what? All of those are okay. Like you just have to build a business that's aligned with who you are and who you want to be and then communicate that really clearly to your employees. And, you know, that works much better than communicating through your lawyers later on. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So I wanted to jump for a minute uh, to the marketing side of things. We did a bunch of stuff that I thought were some great takeaways in the book when it comes to marketing. And one of the things that uh, we're always talking about is th this reality, which was the quote from the book. By the time patients are walking into your practice, they've already researched you extensively and have probably read your online reviews. And I think that's a reality. And it's like, it's contextual too. So those are obviously extremely important because no matter what you're doing with your marketing, if people are researching your practice after they found you and you're not a viable option because your reviews give people pause, that's a concern. Like I've even talked to spot owners that on the surface, they've got a 4.7 star rating on their Google listing. But if you sort by most relevant reviews or newest reviews on Google, you're reading a handful of bad reviews there that I think are really going to hurt your ability to convert patients into booked appointments. So can you talk a little bit more about just reviews, strategies for getting reviews, how to make sure that you're doing a good enough job that that's not as much of a concern in terms of the negative review reviews? Yeah, I think reviews are extremely important. I think a lot of studies say that reviews to customers are just as relevant as personal recommendations from their friends and family. So basically like random reviews from strangers that, that people don't know, they trust them as much as a recommendation from their mother. That being said, reviews are super, super important. And if you have a strategy for getting them, um, that makes a huge difference. So I think you probably are more of an expert at it than I am, for sure. I think for me, the strategy has always been um, make sure that if people are um, sharing feedback with you, whatever it is, that you encourage them to leave a review. So make it easy for customers to leave a review and make reviews a part of the process. And another way to do that without even asking for reviews, which I've, I found worked for us in the office, is you could take some customers' reviews, put them on a canvas, like even buy a group on 
for that service. So you don't have to spend a lot of money doing that. So literally you have Amy's five-star review and you put it like in one of your treatment rooms and in your other treatment room, you have somebody else's review that sends the message to your clients. Oh, people leave reviews here. They, pe- these people like, would like for us to leave a review for them. Let me leave a review. So that's like a very simple way without saying anything to get. I like that a lot. Yeah. I've no, I've never heard anyone say that. That's a really good idea. I feel like you're like, that's playing into the fact that you're conditioning them to like, Oh, people leave reviews. I'll go leave a review. And it's also just reinforcing the positive experience you hope they're ha- hopefully having while they're in the office too, because they're seeing reading someone else's positive experience. That's a cool strategy. I like that a lot. Thank you. I know when you, when you got your first practice kind of off the ground in Ohio there, you mentioned kind of marketing and the things that you had to do to get people in the practice and getting those first few people in the door was crucial, getting reviews and then scaling that. And I think you said one of your favorite strategies was Google ads at the time. Mm-hmm. Was that correct? Yep. Google and, ads, and- getting all my different ex-boyfriends in the office. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I like that. Yeah, and Google Ads are like, that's still generally our number one recommended strategy for the reason that you outlined. It's like, there's no other platform where you can target the people that are actively searching for your services. So targeted, there's nothing else like it. Yeah, exactly. And I know we we do ad campaigns on Facebook and Instagram that are really good with, with generating leads, but they're not as high intent. So you've got to do extra legwork to try to convert those soft leads into booked appointments. With Google, it's obviously very straightforward. Those people are ready to book an appointment. So for that reason, like yeah, we generally are still doing that now. Number one recommended strategy is Google ads for pretty much any small business and especially uh, medical practices. And there's a little section in there about TikTok moving forward. It's something we haven't really dabbled in as a marketing provider. Do you have any thoughts on TikTok moving forward and like using that as an advertising platform as the demo on TikTok starts to age into being, you know, consumers and patients for med spas? Yeah, it's actually, it's interesting. Even we as a law firm get leads from TikTok. So it's interesting because like the med spa clients and the med spa owners are definitely on TikTok. Um, and so I think the strategy is there is just post uh, whatever content that feels natural and authentic to you. So if you're not a great dancer, like I'm not a great dancer. If I had to post a TikTok dance, like I think I would have a heart attack and it would be awful. So like, I would never do that. So for me, what's, what's, um, what works is just posting some questions and answers like once in a while. And so I think that every practice should have a TikTok account and should be posting something, but something authentic to them. Um, but I agree with you. I think Google AdWords, uh, having some, somebody who's an expert really working for you doing Google AdWords is key for, there's no substitute. I have not found anything better with, with marketing to date than just really optimizing Google AdWords. And there's a big difference between optimized Google AdWords and just Google AdWords. Like you really have to have an expert as opposed to just, you know, dabbling in it yourself because that you, and you inevitably don't have the time to check it or the expertise and, it's also very easy to spend a lot of money on Google AdWords um, without noticing. So, yeah, and, and Google tries to sabotage you when they prompt you through the the setup process of an ads campaign a lot of times too. So, if you yeah. look at your search terms report, all of a sudden you'll be showing up for keywords that you never wanted to show up for. You're trying to search. I think we had one recently where someone was they had a Juvederm focus campaign, but the first search term that generated traffic and ad spend was just hyaluronic acid, just that phrase alone. Oh no. So you give Google too much control. Yeah, it can definitely go south. But one of the other things you talked about was, um, you know, how so many practices, just kind of a tried and true marketing strategy at this point is discounting a service to get people in the door. And I think you talk about so many people doing Botox flash sales and discounts to originally get people in the door. But then the challenge becomes, you have them in the door. How do you keep them coming back for more? And that's where in the book, you talk about memberships. And I really like that concept and the principle behind memberships. Could you just talk to that strategy and that idea a little bit more converting patients through memberships? Sure. Yeah. I think um, getting in people through a discount is really is effective. There's nothing else like it. I mean, uh, you could use celebrities, you could use other things, but getting people through a very simple offer that they understand very well, that they in their mind could compare to another offer and they're like, oh, this is good. Okay, let me come in. Let me give this a chance. That works. But then that person has a discount in their mind. So then they're like, okay, I'm afraid of losing the discount. And the fear of loss is very powerful. And the way you quench that fear of loss or you, the way you satisfy it is you say, okay, we're going to give you a membership program that will allow you to keep your discount. So don't worry, you're not going to lose the discount. You don't have to buy a Groupon next time or whatever. You can just 
join our membership and have this low price that you got today, something very similar to it, you know, for the next year. So I think the discount to a membership, as long as the prices are pretty similar, will work very well to retain that discount in mind, the consumer. And deep down inside, like everyone, I think everyone likes a discount. So the discount will bring in lots of people, not just the low baller, like people who don't want to spend money. We did an analysis actually at the practice, um, at the aesthetics practice. We, we were like, okay, our top 10, because there's this 80-20 rule. So we were like, okay, our top 20% of clients, where do they come from? Uh, you know, who are these people spending the most amount of money? And guess what? They were the Groupon customers. Like more than 50% of them came from Groupon, which is crazy. Um, the other big chunk of them came from Google AdWords. So most of the customers came looking for a discount because on Google AdWords, we were also advertising, I think, $10 unit Botox or something like that. So these people were all coming looking for a discount. But at the end, they ended up spending a lot of money, more than people who were referred by their friends and family. Very interesting. Yeah, and I, and I know you mentioned those bonus gifts, and I really like that idea too, that incentive of like, if your membership is hitting the one year point, then you're getting like a free cool sculpting session or something like that after six months or a year. I really like that a lot. Yeah. People, people like bonuses somehow. I mean, we all yeah, do. Oh, absolutely. Yep. And I know like, so, so you kind of recommend with those, with those memberships, almost matching the original discount for the service that you gave them. So they're coming in for a flash sale for Botox with the membership, give them something at that price point or close. Is that mm -hmm. what the strategy mm -hmm. is? Yes, but also charge them a membership fee on top of that. And what does that generally look like? So like, let's say they came in for a $10 unit Botox special, then say, okay, as a member, you're going to be able to get Botox for the rest of the year for $11 a unit. So just a little more expensive, but not really same, almost same price. And also you're going to pay us a hundred dollars a month and you're going to get a free facial whenever you want. So you're giving them a discount, you're having them, you're trying to get them to come in more often because facials happen more often than Botox and you're going to have them pay something, but not that much. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. So is that generally a monthly membership they're paying? Yeah. I mean, that's when I think about it, I think of it as a monthly membership, but I've seen people do it many different ways. I've seen people pay like a yearly membership, like you would to Amazon prime or to Costco. And then that yearly membership price gets you discounts on treatments all year long. You can do something like that. I like the monthly membership that also comes with a monthly service because the more often you could have your customers come in and talk to you and you talk to them and educate them about new things and what's going on and you see a new wrinkle on their face, the better it is for you and for them. So any membership that encourages people to come in very often is great, especially like now the uh, new formulations of Botox are coming out, right? That's going to last six months or nine months. Okay. So is that great? If your client now just comes in every nine yeah. months, I, I don't think so. I think you still need something to have them come in all the time. Yeah. That's awesome. So I had two random little last questions here. One was going back to something we talked about in the earlier conversation with staff, which was, so if, if you're the type of practice that you're going to have short appointment times, get people in and out, obviously these long conversations are like, in-depth conversations with injectors and staff are not part of your strategy. But I thought that was a really like interesting component to a potential marketing retention strategy is developing those pers personal relationships because it builds a connection that's going to be harder to break. And you're going to have people that are less likely to just go price shop services elsewhere if you're building that connection. Can you just real quickly talk about the importance of that and kind of what, what the thought process process is behind developing those relationships with patients? Yeah, I think people want to do business with their friends and people want to trust, want to have the person that's going to be injecting their face, uh, be their friend and be someone that they trust. And the way you build trust is by developing mutual interests and mutual connections and to, by showing the other person that you're truly interested in them. And it's very easy to do using software, like any software that lets you take a note like RX Photo, um, Aesthetic Record, you know, any of these, any of these software where you could next to the patient's uh, information, write, okay, her boyfriend's name is Matt and she's going to a wedding and blah, blah, blah. And just, just make little notes, tell your injectors that as part, and don't just tell them, put it in your, into your policies and procedures that as part of every appointment, you have to write down one piece of personal information that the person shared with you. 
um, and put it into their chart. And then you'll build like a whole collection of, of what's happening. And then when they come in, you'll be like, oh, how was the wedding? And they're going to be like, oh my God, like, you know, Sarah's my best friend. That is awesome. I love that. That's solid gold. That's great. And then the last little nugget that I wanted to pull from the book was, you, I think you mentioned something in there about outsourcing customer service, if, if I read that correctly. And I know one of the challenges as a small business medical practice, med spa, is you've got people kind of doing their job all day, and there's not really like a great customer service component to the business. And that's especially true when it comes to leads and the ability to follow up with marketing leads. There's not really someone that can do that on a dedicated basis. Can you speak to that a little bit? I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, um, I think for your sales process to be effective, someone has to be dedicated to following up with leads. And of course, if you're a small practice, you can't have a dedicated person doing that. So it, you absolutely should outsource it to someone or an agency or overseas person, whatever. So there are different ways to do it. But leads go cold very quickly in this industry because what happens is the person has many options. So they just call the next phone number or they go to the next website and book an appointment. Oh, you don't have online booking? Okay, I'm going to book the next person. So I think that following up with leads is super important. And if you don't have someone on staff, that's okay. Just outsource it so that people are followed up with. It's going to usually pay for itself very, very quickly. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate it. I feel like that was full of, full of great nuggets today. Can you let everyone know where they can find out more about you and what you're up to? Um, my website is lingialaw.com. And um, you can also find me on Instagram on Lingia Law or um, my email, sarah.shickman at Lingia Law. But I'm pretty easy to find. I think if you guys want to find me, you will. And the book is on Amazon, correct? Yes, the book. It's called Med Spa Confidential. I wrote it with Dr. Carol Clinton, who's awesome, and it's on Amazon. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. We appreciate it. We'll have to have you back because I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much, Rick. And me too. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. This podcast is a production of Med Spa Magic Marketing. If your med spa or aesthetic practice is in need of digital marketing services, help with advertising on Facebook, Instagram, Google, lead generation, and booking more appointments, please visit medspamagicmarketing.com.